Welcome back, friends. Today we are at Reverb Music Festival 2024 with a guest that just got off stage. Howdy, howdy. How's it going? Dude, welcome to the show, Bubba Sparks. Thanks for coming. Pleasantly thanks for present. Yeah, dude. This was cool. You drove in, though, right? Have you been in the Midwest no, for a I minute? I flew in. I flew in. But I, well, I flew to uh, into Rochester, Minnesota oh, sure. um, last weekend. Sure. And then I had this today. That was last Saturday. And then today I had to be here. So I just kind of stayed in Minneapolis and just chilled out. Got some oh. friends up there. Went to the studio a couple couple nights. Uh, it's a good little semi relaxing, you know, week. Dude, Minnesota is a good spot. I'm actually going Especially to Rochester. What, what, what I was most in, you know, uh, allured to was the fact that it's still ninety something degrees and humid as hell down in Georgia. <laughs> I don't know if I, sorry if I use the wrong language. No, you're good. But um, and um, you know, it was like first few days it was like seventy degrees and no humidity in the daytime, like fifty five at night. I was like, fall's already coming to Minnesota. I'm I'm here chilling. That's what it's like all the time through the summer. It's beautiful here. I think that Wisconsin, Minnesota summers are the best of anywhere in the country. In I believe opinion. it. I believe it. It's just those winters. Yeah, for sure. How do you like have you ever been to Eau Claire? Is this the first time you ever no, been I've to the city? Here. I've been here before. Oh, okay. Have yeah. you ever performed? Like yeah, which I have. spot? Uh, I don't remember, but I know I've been here before. Down- it was a club, yeah, like downtown. Somewhere downtown? Yes. Oh, maybe it was at the Plus. We have a lot of shows that It could have been there. that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, have you been performing a lot of festivals and stuff? Are you, like, touring yeah, at the Yeah, this summer moment? I have, yeah. Sure. Like several. So especially, like, with the guys from my era, you know what I'm saying? Like, similar to this yeah, one. Yeah, because there's some... Uh, are you guys performing tomorrow somewhere? I know a bunch I'm of the not, guys are. No. Uh, we've been doing the tacos and tequila thing, though. And, yeah, uh, okay. And that was in, like... I did five of those. Sure. Um, this is like the eighth one of these that I've done this summer, like of those type of shows. I, mean, I, I do, if I'm not touring, touring, like, yeah, I do, you know, five to seven shows a month, you know. Oh, okay, cool. I try to be selective, but you yeah. know, it's, it's still out there as much as I want it to be, though. Yeah, I think it's hard to balance, though, right? Writing music and recording new stuff as well as performing. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's even harder to balance all that in a family, which is why I'm divorced. But <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I mean, I am too. How many kids you got? I don't have any kids. Oh, word. I, I kind of traded. It's sad. I, I, I'm very regretful. and I was very careful in my earlier rapper, quote unquote, days. Yeah. I didn't. All my friends had multiple baby mamas and everybody was miserable in the situation. And I just didn't didn't want that you know what i mean so sure. i was very careful next thing you know you can be too careful yeah. and you know and by the time <laughs> i did get married god bless my ex-wife um we were madly in love had a great couple years it just happened to be before we were actually married sure and she was catholic so it was you know we weren't prior to the and then we got married and hell we're already coming unraveled by that time man and so it just never materialized and it's really sad man i'm 45 and it's like you know, all my, most of my friends are done raising kids now, you know, and they got yeah. grandkids and they're, you know, buying RVs and stuff like that, you know, and here I am like, dang, she's like, am I still going to be able to have a kid? You know, I, up to about 50, I say I would maintain hope, but I'm not going to be 77 at a high school graduation. <laughs> my kids are going to, I got two kids, an 11-year-old and 8-year-old, and right. my younger one will graduate when I'm 44. How old are you now? 34. 34. <laughs> good age, so, man. Enjoy your 30. Yeah, man. I mean, I'm definitely trying to. Um, so what's up with new music right now? What are you working on? Are you man? I'm doing. I'm uh, my next album, Country Money Legendaire, is uh, is coming out. I would say it'll be out fourth quarter. Okay. Yeah. About how many songs are you doing on that? Because um, a lot of times people are doing really short things these days. No, I'm, I'll be doing a whole. Now the songs got shorter, like you know, because people's attention span is so much shorter. Normally, yeah. some songs I definitely never do a third verse sure. on a song. Now yeah. uh, that's like prehistoric, you know to. Yeah, and uh, some songs I'll even just do if it's if if I come on with a hook and then you know rap a full sixteen and then have a hook after that I'm looking to get out of there for sure. Soon, you know, like a two 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 to two and a half minutes is kind of like prime. Um, it's like your target area these days for a song length. Yeah, I think with streaming platforms like that, are you still doing a lot of features and stuff these days? Or not yeah, really? I do some. I do some. Because that automatically makes the song a little longer when you got multiple people on it, right? I mean, not automatically, but... Well, we just put out one. I'm also doing a, a, a protege of mine named Dusty Lee from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we're putting out a joint album. It's actually coming out September 6th. I always forget to plug it, but... Um, and we've released uh, five singles from that project, and it's doing really, really well. And um, and so naturally, he and I are on every song. But then we had a, our most successful song uh, features two other artists. Features a guy named Jam Wayne, a new uh, country country rapper that's really buzzing from uh, from Alabama. 
and uh, D Thrash of the legendary Georgia Boys, and and uh, the song goes to like four and a half minutes long, and it's our it's our uh, most successful song. Like the video's only been out like less than three months. It's got like six hundred thousand views. It's like oh wow, killer. What do you think about um, all the? I guess what I was listening to a different interview with you, and they called it hip hop. Huh. <laughs> but I feel like there's been a lot of more, a lot more like country hip hop coming yeah, out, and there's a lot been. coming out of Wisconsin, and Minnesota. It's just now more too. genre bending period, I think. Yeah. Like, but uh, but yeah, it's only natural. You know what I'm saying? It's like I was just the first person maybe to just consider it as a realistic like hell why not you know what I'm saying yeah. it just takes somebody to say why not and then something exists a lot of times you know but um, these guys grew up listening to everything man you know what I'm saying and some of them much like me it was like I was a country boy you know somewhat of a street background predominantly country and and uh, I just fell in love with hip hop music, man. And so that was like no music had ever spoken to me prior to hearing hip hop. Sure. Like music was all around me. Uh, my father, traditional country. Uh, my oldest brother, Iron Maiden fan. You know what I mean? Mm. My uh, my other brother, like Parliament Funk. You know what I'm saying? Like stuff like that. And I didn't. Care. It was all around me. I didn't care about any of it. Then I heard NWA, and it was like, what is that? You know? Sure. And it just spoke to me, man. And so. I don't know. I just fell in love with the spirit of it, to be true, to be sure. Um, How long do you think it took you to really find your own voice with it? Because when uh, you're doing I'd something totally I'd different. I'd say probably, let's just say I wrote my, from the time I wrote my first rap. All right, I was oh, 14 sorry. years yeah. old. I'd say, and I got my record deal with Interscope at 22. Okay. All right, so let's say probably about, I was probably about 20 years old when I really found my my own sure. stride after tinkering with stuff you know you just first off it's just a joke when you first start right and then some one of your friends says you're really good and you're like you kind of already suspected it but you're like uh you know but then coming from somewhere where i came from where people just <laughs> you know what i mean lagrange georgia and being a white boy it just the country it just <laughs> nobody was really even not accepting of it but just even willing to acknowledge that it could even be a thing you know what i'm saying yeah, sure. let alone you being it right and so, uh, yeah, I, I didn't have much success, like, uh, support, you know. Right. Um, I, I had actually, ma- I was on TV before people stopped laughing at me behind my back, you know, type type sure. deal. But I, I, you, I think you have to be able to thrive on that. Yeah, I think so. You know, I think a lot of people that allow that to just cripple them, you know, and stop impede their movement forward, and that um, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? You need to go do something else. Did you struggle with imposter syndrome a lot during I did. that time I really frame? did, especially just because even when I started, like, <clears throat> doing songs with Jada Kiss and, you know, people like that, you know, guys I had grown up idolizing, you know. The only people I felt like I fit in with was, was the Dungeon family, you know what I'm saying? They were, that's sure. The reason that was is because they we were from the same place, and I just related to them on a lot of levels, but... When I would be around like the guys in New York, like I'm at the studio, Rough Rider Studio in Yonkers, you know what I'm saying? And they're the real rap. They're from New York. And, it, you know, and it's just, yeah, I did have a little bit of that. And I'll never forget the late, great Rico Wade just passed this past uh, April, um, the patriarch of uh, the Dungeon Family, Organized Noise. And uh, we were recording on Deliverance, my second album. And uh, we would go out to his to the dungeon which was his house and we would record uh, all night and then we would he would drive me back to atlanta to the city which was about 20 miles was where my hotel was and we would have breakfast at my hotel and just talk about what we've done what we want to do the next night stuff like that and i remember we're sitting there and i say and it, this guy was even before trust me like it's it's very genuine when i say he was my the person that i most wanted to prove to that i w- was worthy and you know that yeah and um, and as we're sitting there talking, you know, he looks at me because I'm babbling on about something. I'm half drunk. And he's like, you know, Bubba, he said, it's OK that you're you. And I was like, I had this is my second album. I'm feeling myself. I went platinum the first time. I'm like, yeah, of course. It's, it's cool to be me. He said, no, Bubba, grab me. He said, no, it's OK. And I just started crying. And it was like it took me a long time to really fully process that, you know, um, but it was like, dang, like, I think that's, I was on my second album before I truly, like, I could I could mentally, like, wrap my head around why it was okay for me to be me. 
because I know hip hop is about authenticity. How could you be more authentic than I was, you know, coming from where I was coming from and just repping that, you know what I mean? And, but for him to just really say at that, my, my guy, you know what I'm saying? Like my, for him to say that, you know, it, 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 it set me in a, in a, in a different direction, you know, of just really walking in my, in, in who I, in my reality and who I really am and what I really wanted to say from there, you know, because until you know who you really are, it's hard to know exactly what you want to say, you know? And, yeah. And uh, like I said, I could always mentally just, I could process it, but as far as the spiritual component of just walking into it, you know what I mean? Sure. It really helped. Did you face any pressure on trying with like labels or anything, trying to push you in any direction yeah, after that? They would just try to push you more like, and even Timberland, you know what I'm saying? Like I wouldn't call him the label, even though I was signed to him to beat club, but he was just always pushing to go like, go extra hokey in country you know what i'm saying like yeah. that was kind of the white boy gotta capitalize off the white yeah. boy you know and i think um there was some of that in interscope but interscope was just more about dollars and cents it was always them trying to figure out how to just make something work the most you know what i mean like yeah but they would also take an i had a great experience with interscope records man you know what i'm saying like right. as far as me and interscope records goes and even the I was the issue much more than they were the issue, even though they were the issue sometimes. Now, in me and Timberland's relationship, I could say it's about 50-50, maybe a little more so his sure. his deal, to be honest with you. But with Interscope, man, it was the New York Yankees, the L.A. Lakers, you know, as a first-class organization, you know. Right. I, I, I wasn't even uh, platinum yet, and they were flying me first class. You know, I got then I did a big multi-million dollar deal with Virgin Records after that. And I'm thinking that's just how it is, and they won't—they're really tripping. They don't want to pay for it on first-class ticket. I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> sure. So but things have changed a lot nowadays. Most people—I shouldn't say most, but a lot of people—are choosing to go independent. I mean, at least to a certain degree. I, mean, I don't I think people choose that. I think they don't have a choice. And sure. then by the time a label does want to mess with them, they've already invested so much money in themselves, and yeah. they can't justify it. Sure. Do you think labels kind of have a chokehold on what people are putting out, though, as far as creatively or anything? No, not putting out, but what people are, are choosing to buy and possibly because they labels. People say act like labels are going obsolete. Well, name me a worldwide superstar that's not signed to a major label. Yeah. Well, just because of all their connections through media and everything, now, right? Yeah, exactly. Late night TV. Sure. What you can do is you can make a lot of money. Young Dolph, you yeah. know, people like that as an independent artist, but you cannot become truly famous without a major label. Sure. Right now with your music, how has your approach changed going into creating it versus, say, 20 years ago? Obviously, it evolves slowly over time. Huh. But I don't know that it's changed a whole lot for myself. Oh, I think... I have so, you have so much more access now to beats than we did back then. You know, back then it was kind of like you went to the studio and then there was one beat that existed. That, sure. You know, the yeah. holy gra grail, grail of beats, you know what I'm saying? And like, you made a song out of that and it might take three sessions, you know. Now, people email you 25 beats, five different guys. Yeah. Now it's a battle of attrition, kind of just trying to sort through. Because after I hear about 10 beats, they all suck. Sure. You know, I always tell guys, I'm like, do not send me more than 10 beats. Don't send me them big zip files full of, because what's going to end up happening, I'm not going to listen to any of them. But I'll say that's the thing. It's like now I have, I go to the studio, and what ends up happening most times is I have parts of like 10 songs <laughs> okay you know and that's because i have so many beats so i'm like oh i like that beat too so you keep going back and forth you get stuck on this and you bounce back over to this because you can do it all just sitting on your phone sounds like a nightmare for a producer to work with <laughs> whereas back in the day it was like you know say you had a cassette tape with that beat on it whatever it was just having access to the thing was a lot more difficult it's just like shooting videos that's that's you know the budget for my first two music videos, Ugly and Lovely. First, Ugly was six hundred thousand dollars. 
Mm-hmm. Lovely was about five fifty. And I spent about I make some decent videos, but I I think it's the thing has kind of drifted away from that being the most important like those mic drop performance all that stuff seems to be yeah getting more clicks than anything you know at this point people just like it real but um if i spend thirty five hundred dollars on a video you know that's that I, i'm like well i spent a little too much on that one <laughs> <laughs> well nowadays i think most of it's all on short form content right like the music video itself doesn't hold the same kind of power that it used to yeah because it's, it's all about those little blurts of one verse of you just rapping the verse, you know what I'm saying? Sure. And it being just done with the iPhone. Like. Sure. Has that been a challenge for you to really work with, or have you just chosen not to put a lot of time and energy into social media? It just media, sucks because or? I don't have a natural affinity for it. Yeah. And so by the time I I stay kind of like trying to kept, catch up all the time, because by the time I get caught up with this, then it's on to something else. and. You know, well, it's a really time consuming thing. It's hard to want to put your time and energy into that. I just love the music, the man. I saw this guy, I was telling him some uh, up and coming trap rapper, I forget his name, but he's he's got some, some juice right now. And he said, I just want to make music, man. I don't want to be a content creator. Yeah. And I was like, Well, amen to that, brother, but <laughs> you might be in the wrong place. I feel like it would be really hard for somebody to come up currently without doing social media at all. Yeah, it wouldn't be possible. All right, I got a different question for you. If you were going to be doing a podcast in the future, if you ever want to do one, and you could interview anyone in the world, who would it be? And why? Huh. Probably uh, Eminem. Just because he... I mean, what's why specifically would you interview Eminem? Well, just because... He was just always... Not even necessarily because of his own thinking, like he just the way it, it timed up. He's like two years older than me. It just like I don't care what he is now. I know what the world was at one time, and I know how on the cutting edge I was. And I could have been Eminem very easily in a sense. And I don't mean like literally like Eminem. Um, I mean I could have been first sure. because there was a period where after Vanilla Ice, a lot of people don't remember this in the nineties. People weren't checking for white rappers. As a white rapper, you kind of wondered was was there was there ever going to be one to get on again? And I knew I was doing the thing at a pretty high level because there were some things you had to figure out. Embrace who you really are. Be up, you know what I'm saying? Like, p- make sure that translates into your music. Whatever that story is, don't lie about where you come from and all that stuff. And be dope. And so, I knew I was like right there on the cusp. And then here comes I, one day I cut on the TV. And say, Hi, and I'm just like, <laughs> what in the hell? Like, yeah, I thought I saw it. I had the vision, you know. And this is the vision, you know. what I'm saying he was just. I, I don't have any problem saying it. Like he's got a lot of respect for me, and and you know I, I clearly respect him. But I just like to hear his take on it on certain things, you know that. With us being on the same label, we were both on Interscope, you know. Oh, um, sure. And then the Timberland, Timberland and Bubba were clearly somewhat, to, on some level, modeled after Dre and Eminem, you know. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I think <laughs> I, I, in certain some respects, failed to live up to that that level of whatever. And I, I can say for Tim that he was not Dr. Dre either, you know. What yeah, I'm sure. And I don't mean as far as the music. I mean as far as you know, everything else that goes into it. And it was just meant for them. You know what I'm saying? That's the bottom line. And, man, he just killed it on such a level that I'm just still in awe of. I'm in awe of his just his talent, his ability, you know. Yeah. I, I, I'm annoyed by him at this point. <laughs> I am because I don't understand why he has to still feel like he want to has a, have a rap contest on every song. And just, like, sure. just make a dope song, man. Like, you like. I sit back with this bag. It's come with a flow instead of no, I'm just trying to go off every time. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, think about like his great songs, man. Like, because to me, his best album is the second one, Marshall Mathers LP, and then Eminem Show is next. Sure. And then that's really about it as far as what I can truly call great albums. Um, good. You know, he's always gonna be Eminem, and he's had great moments, but. And I, this new album, I, I really couldn't listen to it. Yeah, I mean, I tried a little bit. I think at the time when he first w- came out, 
what he was doing was just different than what anybody else had done up until that point. Yeah, which for was sure. What like carried so many fans and what like opened the doors for a lot of people. And the blonde hair too. Yeah, but I, yeah, but I feel like it's just kind of it's somewhat repetitive. The shock shit, it's, it's not yeah, it no more. That's man. what I mean. That's it's what I'm like, saying. Go make evolved. a song, man. You know what I'm saying? Like like just going off and just it's just not going to do it anymore. Yeah. Man. But I think both of you open the doors in different ways for a lot of people. No like doubt. I said, I've been seeing a lot of more like like country rap is a whole huge genre, and in the Midwest, there's a lot of people. We have several people sub-genre. in Eau Claire that do it, or subgenre. But I'm just saying, I just hate a, when they, they, these guys, call, them guys, call it country rap. They call it a genre. But it's not a fucking genre, dude. <laughs> Hip hop is a genre. You know what I'm saying? Sure. You, you didn't invent anything, like yeah, sure. But I mean, still, you took it in a direction that nobody else really had, and yeah, now but you it's still, like that's all the more reason, though. You got to pay homage to work, and I, I think a lot yeah. of those guys. You can't go fly a rebel flag and go and and no. and, and, and do hip hop. You know, that's to me, that's just common sense. You know? Yeah. Um, but some people don't don't see it that way. And it's free country. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, obviously, you should pay homage to it and where the culture came from and everything. But um, these guys I, don't have to do that now because. I was kind of the last generation where you actually had to take a, a physical walk. No matter where you came from, if you was going to get into hip hop, there was a certain walk you had to take. Sure. And if you didn't have respect by the, at the beginning of that walk, by the end of that walk, you were going to have respect for where this thing comes from. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Now you can just kind of do it all from your mom's couch and never right. and be a star and never have to risk anything or Yeah. You know, and I think that that leads to the lack of respect, you know. Yeah, I think everyone is just kind of doing their own thing and they don't need approval from anybody, Yeah, which is kind of a problem because gatekeepers suck. However, gatekeepers exist for a reason, right? Yeah. Uh, and God they help. Father, though, you're the godfather. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, gatekeepers do suck because... But... That's just because people, once again, put their personal bullshit into it. You know what I mean? Like, right. like the premise of what a gatekeeper is, is, is good. You know what I'm saying? That's good because you... It's just like having, like, at a stadium, you got people taking tickets. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's yeah. a similar thing. But I um, I don't know. I I think everything's pretty – a lot of theories are, are pretty cool. Capitalism's a great theory. Uh, communism's a great theory. But when you put human bullshit in it, then it becomes something else. You know what I mean? Right. What do you think – what do you think – is the most common mistake that people are making these days in the hip hop world that are trying to come up? Just just sounding like other people. Sure. But I think there's I mean I guess there's like everything out there. It's hard to be truly original at this point, don't you think? Uh-uh. No. No, nah, you can be truly original. But you're going to have to risk something to do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You got to sure. put something on the line like that's the thing is nobody wants to risk anything. It's like because it, it look, there's some there's something very decidedly different about every person that's ever been born into this world, right? Right. That makes them different than every other person, and it, it is pretty like significant. It's substantial. So, if you truly just embrace who you are and just focus on making that come through in whatever your art is, then you're going to ensure originality. That's going to be at least being. I just hate when I hear a rapper. And I can tell who their favorite rapper is right off the bat. Sure. I, I hate that. Who's somebody that's come up recently that is truly original that you're a fan of? <laughs> well, to, Drake's more original than Kendrick Lamar to me. Sure. Yeah. Kendrick Lamar is like Andre 3000 Jr. to me. <laughs> I can yeah. see that. Yeah. But Drake, now Drake was something that didn't exist prior to, to Drake. I mean, yeah. to truly be able to sing at an elite level like that, and you know, and I personally think Drake got a bum deal in this this thing. This, I, in that feud. I think people just wanted him to lose. I mean, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Because the Family Problem song, <laughs> that was a monster, man. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Had three different songs in one, and he slaughtered on every one of them. You know what I'm saying? So, but it was just a hype train got rolling because Kendrick didn't respond. And, and Kendrick definitely played it like from a, a strategy standpoint. He killed it. But his the songs, I mean, not like us is cool, but his best song actually was the first one he put out to me, Euphoria. Sure. But, it, you know, it was because he didn't respond at first. And then when he did respond, you got a whole we don't like Drake contingent. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. They're, they're just hype. 
I think it's just like it's cool to think Kendrick is cool, and it's not that cool to think Drake's cool. That's right. Cool That's right. <laughs> at this point, if you but, could, but you, you know why it became that way? Because Drake dominated for so long. Yeah, yeah. Mainstream success in general, I think. And he is kind of like he he got some some traits that I don't I don't really dig. You know what I'm saying? As a person sure. that I feel like he's got, but um, he's a hell of a damn talented musician and and. You know, whatever. So hard to argue. If you were going to have, if you could pick anyone to I have, I think Kevin Gates is pretty original. If uh, very true. If you could have uh, a feud similar, where you're going to make a song, somebody else is going to make a song, and you're going to go back and forth a few times, who would you be most interested in doing that with? <sighs> Paul Wall. I have not heard his name in a very long time. <laughs> oh, he's still out here. But you know, we always got compared <laughs> somewhat unfairly to both of us. But just because you're both from the south, no, nah, we the same both time. came around the same time. He was a little after me, um, but we were both kind of built similarly at the time. Sure. And just being the southern guys, I think, and you know, just yeah, we were compared a lot. Still to this day, we're kind of like viewed as like the. Like most black folks would say, they don't fuck with Eminem, but they say they they like Paul Wall and me. You know, <laughs> why do you think that is? Just because I think, for one, Eminem's got a certain type of voice that just mm -hmm. people in the hood I, I ain't really gonna rock with something like that. And then just the lyrical miracle, you know, stuff is not really gonna be too well received. You know, but I think we both got deep voices. Maybe that's like part of it. Yeah. But I just think we just both jamming more. I think that's just like being from the South. Like you can be not jamming and be great at making music. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's it's two different things, man. Like you know, it's like Tech Nine, man. I love, I respect the shit. I Tech Nine's business acumen, his hustle, and I and I know that what he's doing is hard. When I listen to his music, like dang, that's difficult. It's impossible. I can never do that. But it's still not jamming to me. Sure. You know, and uh, so. It's kind of like that, you know. What goals do you still have in music? I'm still trying to fulfill my potential. <laughs> That's it. That's why I know I haven't done it yet. I haven't done. I don't know. It's not even like a. I just love it, man. It's like if you if you're annoyed. Can you believe this man, 45 years old, over here, blah blah blah. Wait till you see me at 65, bitch, because you're gonna have to see that. <laughs> yeah. Because as long as I'm alive, I'm gonna be doing it. Sure. Are you more focused on singles and everything, or are you just trying to do the album? Because if Man, you're trying, I do what the little people tell me to do, put out the singles and stuff like that, but I don't... This is this is a very transitional period in the, in the marketing and selling and distribution of music. I think we're going to look back at this era. This is an era where a lot of folly was committed. You know what I'm sure. saying? Because this whole... They were actually telling us to put out one single every six weeks. Like, God, that, that, man, it's so annoying. And uh, I'm not doing it anymore. Short story long. Where do you think things are headed with the industry? I couldn't tell you. Because uh, hopefully they get these streaming rates adjusted somewhat, you know. I think it, they're a little ridiculous, you know, as far as... Uh, but well, I don't... Yeah. You know, I just... Uh, Nobody possesses anything anymore. It's like... You mean like owning the rights to their music? No, I mean? mean like I own the rights to my music, but I'm talking about like when you buy something or whatever, you can't take possession of it. It's like people sure. still in country rap in particular. Yeah. There's this thing where people get their fans to de to go on iTunes and download and so they can go number one on iTunes for like 30 minutes and be like, they were number one. That's like 4% of the, the overall market. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But... I'm just always like, how stupid do you have to be? I get it. You're just doing him a solid. But because you don't ever, it's like, all right, I spent $11 on this album. You don't take possession of it. You don't, it's yeah. still just in your streaming. Like, you know, it's just crazy to me. But yeah, I mean, I think things are, are changing in that direction in general. People are becoming, I mean, the whole minimalist movement has like kind of changed. People are okay with paying like a subscription fee and everything to things these days rather than having any physical item. Yeah, but when they shut these phones off, it's going to be problematic, ain't it? Yeah. It's going to make you wonder, did any of this stuff ever exist? 
Absolutely. I think that it brings a lot of space for actual performing and stuff now, because there's a lot of people that are coming up that have a song kind of pop on TikTok or whatever that haven't actually performed hardly. You know what I mean? And I think yeah, that sets I a mean, lot of people was, apart, I was a, too. I was a, one of those kind of people to a degree. I didn't have very much performing. I think that's one of the tragic flaws and errors that Interscope committed in relation to me. They took for granted that everything that Eminem possessed, I possessed. And it wasn't true. And just like I possessed some things that he didn't have too. Sure. But he came up in that Outsiders, uh, Lyricist Lounge. He Just that Detroit scene. I had no performing experience. And it showed. You know what I'm saying? It really showed. Um... So, and I'm not a natural performer by any stretch. I'm just kind of more of an introverted, creative type, but as far as that goes, but. Um, yeah, but performing is a lot of how people actually make a living at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I do it. I, I mm-hmm. mean, I made myself a good performer because I just, you, there wasn't no choice. It was either keep looking stupid or get on sure. with it, you know? And um, so, yeah, but I'm just saying, like, it took, it wasn't just to snap your fingers. Yeah. And I was right there doing it in front of the whole world, literally. Yeah. On TRL, on 106 and Park. Sure. Trying to figure out how to not look scared. How did you figure out how to not look scared? Is there anyone you look to? or Just was re- it- I got the right people around me. My sure. boy G-Rock. Um, boy Attitude. You know, came on a... Rico Wade, once again, was a big part of that. Yeah. Um, and my boy G-Rock, I honestly got to say, he just made me, once again, he just... G Rock is a he's an ATL legend, you could say. Um, he's part of a group called the Organization. He had a song can't, it's called "Can't Stop No Player." Anyhow, he's a part of a group that Rico was messing with at the time called Shamdon, and he was just always around the dungeon when I was over there. And he, you know, was from the west side of Atlanta, Flatlands, and he just, uh, he just really, fucking, he just with me in a way that made me believe in myself sure. you know? and so and we just went out there on the road and got to it what's your favorite thing about performing nowadays and what's your favorite song to perform I like performing new stuff man I don't know but you know it's like man I, sometimes it doesn't feel like I could ever perform this new booty again like I, I don't have one more in me <laughs> <laughs> yeah it just doesn't bring you the joy anymore because you've performed it so many times it's just so predictable yeah you know and uh there's no oh you know i like going to the studio and i like shocking myself you know you want to surprise yourself and there's no surprise to that but um what was the last thing you made that surprised you shoot that's stuff i made recently i mean i got that's that's the one you know i say my sword so to speak as far as the, cre- the way, ability to create music, I don't give a damn whoever hears it or if it never sells or nothing like that. I know what I'm trying to do, and I know that um, what level I'm functioning on, and, and uh, I do it pretty regularly, man. You know, because I because I really continue to push that envelope within myself. You know, a lot of these guys they kind of start tapering off and, and just flatline and kind of is. I'm still trending up, believe it or not. Yeah. If anybody listens to my music, they, they, they will. I'm talking about not. I was blessed to work with some great producers early on. You know what I'm saying? I was good back in the day, but Timberland's great. Organized Noise, great. I worked with some great people. Now I'm great. Now I don't necessarily always have the great <laughs> production, you know. Sure. But the fact that I own all my music now and I do pretty got a little core fan base, so I make make pretty well, you know. But. Um, in what areas do you think that you have become greater? man just songwriting like production even like as a producer like just understanding how to put a song together do you do a lot of producing yourself yeah i produce country music do you do it for other artists too yeah what are some other other artists that you did that for i mean i've produced for lee bryce the country i mean i i've produced for yellow wolf i mean like you know but not in the sense of making a beat in the sense of producing like in a like uh, score in, in like a broad sense, you know, like putting the song together. All right, right. this needs to go, diagnosing the song. Like, okay, like come in like this and for four bars, and then, you know, like that's that's production. Beat making can be a very different thing. That right. Not every beat maker is a producer. Right. <laughs> 
Do you envision yourself doing more and more producing? I'll as never time make goes a on? beat. I don't. I don't care nothing about making no beats. But yeah, no. But on the production Absolutely. side, as far as like mentoring Absolutely. other people, helping them with them, their and for music the most and, part, I'm producing my music. You know what I'm saying? Like, sure. There's no producer that I'm sitting with. Like, there's no. Well, I can't say that. I just sat with. A, every now and then, I'll get in, have the chance to sit with somebody. But for the most part, it's just me having beats and then me putting the song together myself. What was the last thing that you learned specifically within production? Was it like a program you've been working on? Everyone's always learning new things. Oh, um, what did I learn? Yeah, because I don't really, like I said, I'm not really involved on that end. It's more like uh, what I was, I learned more about like just horse whispering artists, you know what I'm saying? Stuff like that, How because that's really what you're doing. It's like a coach, you know, and, and just like a coach can't coach every person the same, like to be a truly great producer you know you have to learn the psyche of the artist you're, you're producing and, and how to really get in there and, and extract the best possible things so it's more i focus more on that side of it man just the psychological you know of, of how how to get somebody to you know embrace their crouching tiger hidden dragon you know yeah. like, how to bring out the best who do you think is currently the best producer out uh someone you could learn something from Rick Rubin's just the best. Period, That's exactly man. who I was thinking of when you're describing. That. Yeah, he's the best, man. And, and I, I can learn a lot from just like listening to that man. So I met him once, but man, like he just said something recently. I'm sure you saw it. It was like going around Instagram where he was like, "It's not for the listener. Like I don't care about you. Yep. Like you're the last person that gets a say in the thing. You know what I'm saying? I, mm -hmm. I, I like that. I feel that it's really true too. If you if you talk about true art. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Rick Rubin is is absolutely the man. Where do you envision yourself going after, let's say, in ten years? Where do you want to get to? Still just making music yourself more, or do you want to be more so on yeah, the production I mean, you side? Just be, you just want to be more. You just hope you can just. I just want to be more comfortable and more financially. You know, just you know, I do well. I mean, I've had tax debts. I've had issues. You know, financially, but. It's kind of like this. I just would like to just be able to get to a place where I'm just, you know, have enough money to do whatever I want to do for the rest of my life, no matter what. You know sure. what I'm saying? And I've had it a couple times before, but it just, it uh, it was fleeting, you know. I got divorced and got hammered. You know, just stuff happens, you know. But, yeah. um, but if you can just figure out the right way to fish, you know what I'm saying? Instead of just hoping that you accumulate the, enough fish, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Um, you know, I think there's something out there that I can do that basically is always working for me, and I never have to work for it. You know what I'm saying? Like this, just I think there's something out there that I can figure out that will always be generating income, and I don't even have to tend to it. Passive income? Yeah, passive income. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess I the the saying that I always think of is I just want to be financially free to create. Because I don't care about money. Until yeah. I don't have any, until, <laughs> I don't have, until I don't have enough to do something I want to do, then I, I, we got to get to it then. <laughs> do you think your relationship with money changed a lot after you had blown through some? <sighs> Not really, man. I just, I can't, I can't master that one, man. I just, I, I like to make money, but I love to spend it. <laughs> what was your last irresponsible purchase? <laughs> oh my God. <sighs> man, I, I, I spent... Over a hundred thousand dollars last year on DoorDash, <laughs> but but specifically, Dick Sporting Goods. You can order Dick Sporting Goods on DoorDash. What are you ordering jerseys or like what I, was you get? I mean, it was like cr the Christmas season one time, and I was just literally ordering a new pair of shoes every day, just out of like I, I was just gonna get every pair of shoes they had, and I did it. And you know, it's just I just. Oh, I gotta, I gotta go where? I gotta go to the grocery store. Oh, I'm gonna order something to wear. You know, just I got every sweatsuit. I mean, then I lose them in hotels, and I gotta get another one. You know, it's, that was my favorite. How many pairs of shoes do you think you have at this point? I couldn't even tell you between my mama's house. And, yeah, I mean, five hundred. What's, what's your favorite pair? Uh, right now it's my uh, I got these New Balance like house slippers kind of things. Sure, I love them camouflage <laughs> <laughs> sick if you could only wear one shoe the rest like one pair of shoes the rest oh, of your I'd life, have to wear something it. a little more some some boot type shoes i got these my, these air jordan boots like uh they're they're like a, a hybrid of a michael of a jordan mm. and like a boot 
yeah. I really like those a lot. That's probably what I'd go with. Do you have anybody custom paint shoes for you ever? No, nah, I don't care for all that. Really, like I just like I don't know, all the paint and stuff. I mean, I I would keep it as a as a as a keepsake anyway. But yeah, I, I never really got into that. But um, man, I, I I really started to get into like the like true Jordan like being a Jordan snob and like ordering these Jordans like that, that'll, you'll spend some money doing that in a hurry I think you definitely spend money doing that really Ooh, fast I'll tell you I got in I had to leave that alone because what happened was I got some Jordans from Dick's one time and these people I took a picture and they were like man you're wearing them trash Jordans I'm like what are these $200 what are you talking about and they're like no, you know and explained all that to mm. me and I was like okay then I turned up on the suckers for about six months spent about Twenty-five thousand on Jordans, and then, yeah. <laughs> what's your What's your favorite thing to do outside of music? What interests do you have? Hobby wise, mess with that girls, <laughs> not women. <laughs> like honestly, if I'm being honest, until you find the one and have kids. I already had the one, but couldn't hold on to her. Um, yeah, man. I just, I guess, like the the guys, the psychological guys that I'm under is like, yeah, I'm just looking for. Her, but really. Even if I get her, I'm still, I just, I like women, man. I really do. I really do. I like the, the pursuit of women, getting to know a woman, like find the difference, the in- intricacies of like each. It's just beautiful. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. And I hate them too. <laughs> sure. But, but, you know, we're stuck. We stuck together. Yeah. What about uh, traveling? What's your favorite place you've been to so far? Uh, Cause you did, a, you must've done a lot of international stuff at one point, uh, right? The Maldives is my favorite place I've ever been to. How many times you been there? Once. And you got to get another show to go back I was, at some I was point? 12. I was over there 12 days, and it's a crazy story, but I, and that's too long for me to get into, but it involved the <laughs> national police and all kind of stuff. But, yeah, we, it, was, it was a free trip, and and, uh, and I was getting paid a bunch of money for it. And the place I stayed, you know, like those huts built out over the water. You oh, know? yeah. And I was in, the, the, like, the penthouse when it was called the Madonna Suite, and it rented out. Like if I if you'd been paying for it, it was like forty six hundred a night, and I was in that, I was in there for like twelve days. <laughs> That's where the irresponsible spend. I mean, no, you said you went for free. Yeah, and I was in, I was eating lobster every. I mean, just anything. Uh, sc- I went scuba diving five or six times. Like everything was free. Like we just go. Keep I'm it. a diver myself. I was just diving in Costa Rica. Actually. I love it. I love it. I, but you know, I, I, it's gotten to where I don't really care to get in the ocean. Um, just because animals are acting funny <laughs> like right now i don't know what's going on in the world but you see whales jumping it's just you know I, it's their domain you know what I'm saying? i think a lot of people forget that you know that sure. people are like what is the shark doing what do you mean what is the shark doing yeah. <laughs> so what are your biggest fears then are you afraid of deep water and yeah i, I kind of have that phobia that they talk about of like being the deep deep water yeah i got that because it's like claustrophobic or why it's like the opposite of claustrophobic i guess sure you know, I feel like when I dive, my feet it's dangling. Like that's what I don't like. Like once I get under the water, I'm fine. But it's it's like, you know, like the thought of bobbing like a cork, and then like the USS Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did the story of the, you know that story? Mm-hmm. The USS Indianapolis uh, in World War II, basically like they were carrying like one of the bo- like something, and they they had a problem and like the radio communications because they were dropping the bomb were cut off, and so they couldn't get in touch with anybody for like but they're out there sinking and all the soldiers like 2500 soldiers went in the water they were in the water for like a week near and like all but 400 of them they said men were literally their top would be and then their bottoms would be eaten off by sharks they were all like basically just it's because people are feeding sharks out of their stupid boats man (laughs) i mean it's a long time ago i mean sure but i think you know the blood got in the water and sure they're just being animals at that that point i mean it's not it wasn't it wasn't like Jaws? It wasn't like a personal vendetta against nobody. But, sure. But it, you should check out that story. I definitely will. What was your you favorite? know you know in Jaws when the man nineteen forty two that he's telling that story basically. He's, oh sure. He's saying he was on that you know the USS Indianapolis. Like Fourteen yeah. men went in the water. You know. Dude, I I saw Jaws recently for the first time. Oh, it's and not. then it actually finally freaked me out when I was uh, scuba diving. <laughs> because really? I was thinking things were gonna start like popping up like yeah. that, like the shark does in the movie. That's crazy because uh, it finally got yeah. Because our minds are moving, aren't right they? Yeah, there's something. What's you know? your favorite movie? Uh, Rounders. Edward That's Norton. a poker movie, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Do you play a lot of poker? Not really, but I just the, that was around the time I was like t- trying to get it on with my career, 
And when that movie came out, and it was just like, roll up a state and go to Vegas, man. It's like, does my name, does it have my name on it? I don't know, but I'm going to find out, you know? Like, yeah. That's Edward Norton Jr. who's in that? Yeah, and Matt Damon. He might be my favorite actor of all time. <laughs> uh, Edward Norton? Yeah. He's good. Yeah, he's incredible. American yeah. History X? Yeah, I, that was one of the movies I was going to point out, actually. Raw, yeah, man. I think he's incredible in that movie. He sure is. Well, dude, again, thank you so much for letting oh, me Thank you for having you. me, man. This was really rad. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.